You are listening to the Park Flyer Podcast, where we discuss our RC adventures. Welcome to the Park Flyer Podcast, where we discuss the ups and downs of the new RC Flyer. Join your hosts, Michael and Jay, as they take flight at the park. Now on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome to the Park Flyer Podcast. I'm Michael from Arizona. With me always is my good friend, Jay from the hills of Texas. And we're missing that AK Mike again. He is out traveling the world. I think he was in New York or Chicago or somewhere. Anyway, he's uh, traveling. So he's uh, I think he, he's, he, he uh, went traveling. to Hoboken, New Jersey. At some point, but I think we got a text that said Chicago's behind me finally. So I, I think he wound up somewhere. I'm not really sure. We, we'll have to ask him when he gets back because it's just a mystery. So, But anyway. He's not with us tonight, but uh, <laughs> before we get started on tonight's topic, uh, how about a word from our sponsors? Three D Aerovictures adding fun to the RC hobby, one layer at a time. Feeling weak and powerless? Sounds to me like you need A-Power batteries. When someone needs the best, they always choose the AT. A-Power batteries. Get on the web and get yours today. And we're back with the Park Fire Podcast. Uh, welcome, everybody. We appreciate you joining us. And uh, if you haven't already, go to our Facebook listeners group and join. Uh, we try to post stuff on there, and everybody kind of, you know, follows or talks to each other and we also have a youtube channel that uh, jay has been uh, kind enough to be monitoring and putting together so check that out on the park flyer podcast youtube channel and with that in the bag you my friend got to go fly finally i did but before we get to that you're in new finally. digs what, what's up what's that I am you're, uh, you're not in your I, location in your mobile am, uh, <laughs> command center. I, I'm I'm in my mobile location. This is my wife's new office. You can see we haven't quite unpacked. We are officially in the new house. Uh, my shop is coming along. I think our next uh, our Christmas episode might just be from the secret shop, secret Santa shop uh, here at the um, you know, the new digs. So. Uh, I got my tables done. I got, uh, you know, all my stuff kind of piled in there. It's a very big mess right now, and I didn't really have a place to set my computer stuff up, so I kind of ran into my wife's room and took over her her office uh, so that we could do this episode. But uh, like I said, I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. So I think you've uh, kind of taken a preview. You've seen well, uh, would, a little bit. Who wouldn't be excited to have an uh, actual bit, house bit. over their head? <laughs> compared to this last 14 months, which has been very, very difficult. Uh, it's been a long 14 months. It's about how long it's taken us to build this place. Uh, but we are very happy with it. Uh, both my wife and I are very excited. Uh, we still have a few things to kind of work out and uh, some cabinets that were missing. You know, they let us move in, but there was still, you know, several items that needed to be addressed. We were okay with it. We weren't going to, you know, sit out on the front porch and wait until all that got fixed. But uh, most of it's fairly minor. It doesn't affect us moving in. It's just cosmetic stuff on the inside. But we are very, very happy to be in a place that we can call our own. So, and now that we got it all set up, or we're getting it all set up, it's time to move. Thanks. Yeah, we're pretty excited. Um I think we're going to do an open house at some point. And uh, like I said, next time on our YouTube channel, I'll take maybe a tour of the uh, new shop, which I'm very excited about. And I'll hopefully get some cameras or whatever that I can set up in there. And we can maybe do some build sessions and stuff uh, on our podcast or YouTube channel that we can, you know, put new items together. Because I have a whole boatload of airplanes in the boxes that, you know, I could uh, we could build while we talk. I could build while I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> so anyway, yes, we're excited. You can't tell. So, 
Well, tell us a little bit about uh, your flying. Yeah, so uh, Jim and I got together and we went out uh, flying today. Uh, and I have to say, it was a very nice day. Um, for Texas, we're having an unusually mild winter. It was almost uh, in the low 80s. There was no wind. It was kind of overcast. So it was perfect. And uh, the good news was that was good because we had to do a bunch of maidens and a bunch of re-re maidens. Hmm. Hmm. What what did you made? So we had several, you know, we had one one new plane and then we had two old planes that we were remaidening again. Um, and then we had uh, just one small EDF, his little uh, uh, Panther that we were just flying. That one we weren't, that was the only actual like flying plane that we had. Uh, and that's what we started off flying with. And for the most part, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Jim and I hadn't flown that plane for uh, about two months. So um, it took a little while for Jim's uh, hand-eye coordination to kind of catch up with the plane. Luckily, it wasn't too windy. Um, the other thing was, um, since it's on his uh, Futaba radio, you know, his dials get turned and stuff gets flicked, you know, switching between the other planes. So... You know, the where we had it dialed in perfect the last time we flew, you know, we kind of turned the gains up or down and kind of off. So it took a little while before, you know, I kind of got it retrimmed up, redialed back in with the trims for the gyro. And then, you know, Jim kind of caught up with the plane and then, you know, uh, it, but he flew it well. We didn't smack it into anything. Um, and that plane flew really well. But the nice part was um, he did, after we kind of got warmed up to that, that particular aircraft, he had a new plane uh, from Hobby King, and I think it was an early Christmas gift for him. And um, so it was called the Kingfisher. So it's a Cub-style plane. Um, so it's kind of like in the vein of my Fun Cub. Uh, Jim says that it's it took him all of maybe 10 15 minutes to put together he said that there wasn't one glue joint uh in the whole plane you know it was he put it together with a screwdriver sure uh, he said it you know uh, the build was super super easy um i can attest to when i picked you know picking up that plane compared to my fun cub it's made from a lighter it's epo foam but it's much much lighter where that EPO foam from the multiplex planes, or it's a dense EPO, this right. plane was the total opposite. Right. Really? Really? Hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, the gear that we had Jim set up in there, we had a lemon receiver, so it had a gyro uh, in it. Um, the uh, We got the gyro kind of set up, um, you know, where we could, flick it on and off with a switch. So I, uh, when I went to made in the plane, um, I just turned the gyro off and I figured I would go ahead and get it, you know, all dialed in first and then flick on the gyro to see what craziness happened, you know, afterwards. But, uh, right. I can tell you what, um, really that plane gave me, gave us no trouble. Now, Jim had initial problems with the plane when he was setting it up and it was with the flaps he was setting up the flaps on his Futaba radio, and I'm not sure what he did, but as he was setting up the, the mix or whatever, uh, he turned that mix on, and it either jammed up or his uh, the, the flaps were already at their limit, and they he burned them up. He burned up the, uh, the servos, and I've never seen that before, where the servos get a little jam up and burn up like that. Yeah. Well... Well, I will tell you that the I will tell you that the what what happens with those servos is that they probably were already maxed out so that that when he flipped the switch on the flaps, it went all the way to the max or it was supposed to go the other direction. A lot of times that I've seen the that other way. That's what I was a thinking. Lot of times Yes, where it goes the other direction, and instead of going down, they go up, and then they burn the servo out. So, uh, luckily, you know, he's a master repairer, so he fixed that uh, 
you know, a couple of days ago and had the, the plane all ready to go. So, um, and he had, you know, he'd figure out the problem, uh, had the flaps, you know, on a switch. Um, and, and honestly, you really didn't need him. My goodness. So he said that the, this particular plane can fly on a three S or four S. And let me tell you, it's got a lot of pickup and, and go on three S it's, it's a pretty, you know, speedy little plane. In fact, it's rather torquey, you know, so you got to be a little bit care- careful if you go full power, you know, because it wants to, you know, torque over to the right or whatever. So you got to kind of watch it. So if you get too slow and too low and you jam the, you know, you're used to just jamming the full power, you might get yourself in a little trouble. So, in fact, to take the plane off, you barely need to get the three quarters throttle in order to get off the ground. And I mean, it comes off the ground within three feet. It just, you know, little back pressure, boop, and it's up and it's flying. Wow. That's, uh, so, so why do you think it, uh, why do you think that is? What, I mean, what you were just talking about, why it was, if you, if you gave it too much start, you'd be in trouble. Um, well, either, either, you know, the props too big or too, you know, there's too much prop, um, or there's just, you know, a lot of torque for the motor. And, um, you know, like you said, you, you slam the, uh, you know, you jam the throttle forward and it just kind of torques over to the left of the, you know, over, let's see, it's the right, right. It's torques to, torques to the, yeah, whichever way it torques, I can't think of it now, but you know, it's, it torques in that direction. If yeah, to the left, it, it, you know. When you uh, when you jam the throttle, it, it 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 will torque a bit, so you just have to watch giving it full throttle or do it smoothly. If you do it slowly and smoothly enough, it's it'll be fine. But uh, right. it's just got a lot of go. So and that's on three S. So I can't imagine if you can fly four S on the same prop or you don't have to prop it down. Whew, that plane, that plane, you know, pretty much can just you know if you drop the flaps on that and a little bit of wind, you could just take right off you know straight off the ground probably. So, wow, that's amazing. The only, the only other advantage I could wow, see with that particular amazing. plane is, uh, if, cause it came with floats and skis. So if you were on floats, you know, you're a little, and it's, you know, floats are a little draggy. And so, you know, if you wanted to make sure you, it wasn't draggy with the 4S, you know, if you're flying on water, that fantastic. So, but, uh, yeah, I, we, you know, I got the plane up, was flying it around, trimmed it all out. Um, I went ahead and put the gyro on put in a little bit of uh, a little bit of gain on that thing and then you could just slow the plane down you know it had low uh, low flight stability anyway but with the gyro on it was just rocks it was just rock steady you know um yeah. took it around a patch a couple of times landed and gave it over to jim and he was able to take it off and fly it around and um he didn't have too much trouble with it uh he only had one small mishap he was coming in for a landing um, he, he was, it looked like he was going to go a little long. So, you know, he kind of did one bounce or, you know, he decided to abort and he fell back into the, that old habit that he has. He, you know, just cram the, you know, like most people, you just cram the throttle, you know, forward. And then it, that, you know, the, the plane pitched over to the left and, uh, luckily he just had enough. He was still high enough and had a little bit more speed that he was able to over, you know, he had enough room to overcome it and fly out of it. So, uh, you know, the first couple of times I was telling him, Hey Jim, slow down. You know, you, you don't have to be in a rush to get to the ground, you know, cause he, he had that thing, right. he had the thing, you know, buried right. taking off and then I, you know, he's climbing cause the plane would climb, uh, due to it too. So I would just be like, yeah, just half throttle, quarter throttle. That's all you need on this thing. And once he kind of figured that out, you know, he was having a blast. So that, that plane was a lot of fun and we, you know, we were definitely enjoying it. Um, then the wind picked up a little bit, and I was uh, playing with the flaps, and uh, he had a little bit too much flap in there for my uh, liking. You know, we didn't, we you know, we didn't have any um, what's the word uh, down mixed in elevator mixed in with it, so you could give it just a little bit, and that thing would climb. So you had to be real careful. Um, but I could, if once we get that all figured out, you know, and programmed in the radio, it, that it's going to be a fun plane. And like I said, for the price and what he what he paid with it, you get skis and you get floats. Although skis in Texas don't really need well, we might need it in February. We have another snow apocalypse, but you know, uh, for for the sure. price of what you get, all the stuff you get with the plane, sure. it, 
it's a good it's a good flying plane. I I would recommend it for any beginners or anybody who wants that style of plane uh, to get it. It's, it would be a lot of fun. And, and it's that's very a hobby man. You have a lot of rudder authority on and that's that. That's a that's hobby, plane. right? And that's a hobby. It's king a hobby aircraft, king plane. It's called right? the King that's Fisher. A hobby king air. Hmm. All right, very cool. How much does it cost? Uh, that's a good question. I want to say just off the top of my head, um, I want to say it's like maybe one fifty. One maybe with the sales, it was between one thirty and one fifty. Right. So you know, right. it's not too bad. That's a pretty good price point, actually, for that type of, um, you know, that type of aircraft, especially for, you know, for it being just a, like a fun cub, and it came with all those accessories, and it makes it, you know, kind of yeah, cause I, I had one to pay size for, you know, like floats. Kind of the floats were extra. One you know. size right. fits all. Right. 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 Very cool. And since that well, comes with everything, like, it's, a, it's a really good cool. deal. Well, so. Like, right. Right. Very right. cool. Right. Well, what else did he have out there? Well, we, uh, after, like you said, we flew with the Panther first, um, kind of got warmed up with that. Then we maiden the Kingfisher, uh, put a couple of batteries through it. Um, and, oh, and the other thing, um, you know, with the standard 2200, uh, three, you know, milliamp, uh, uh, three cell, we're getting good flight times out of that. You know, when you're flying it like at half, you know, half to quarter quarter throttle boy it was you could just put put around and you know and just get on the uh get on the throttle for maybe some acrobatics or something it it the battery just lasted a long time it, it was really that part was really nice as well um so after we got done we got done with that um we jim got another he, he brought out another plane for us to fly and it's the uh sig rascal um and he got a new motor for it uh, before he was flying on a four S and it flew okay on a four S it was, it was pretty speedy right. uh, with the right. setup that he had. Right. It, it, the, the plane flew right. really, really quickly. Um, and once again, we hadn't figured out that, you know, Sig Rascal has flaps and, um, and it's a high wing as well. Uh, we, it, we hadn't figured that out. And I was like, Oh boy, this is a plane. Cause it was so fast on, you know, you'd come in for a landing, either you had to go way out, you know, for an approach to come into land to, to kind of get your, everything set up or you had to, you know, you, it has flaps. You could drop the flaps, but the flaps once again, weren't, you know, in line with what the rudder was doing. If, you know, so if you weren't on the sticks to, for the, for the boost up for how much flaps you gave it, you know, it became a handful. So it didn't like right. it was hard to get it slow just with the combo that the, that he had with the 4S and the size of the prop that he had. So it was it was kind of speedy. Well, he got a different motor, uh, and the reason he got a different motor was because for his A10, you know, he got a bunch of six cells, and so he has these big right. six cells, and and the Sig Rascal could carry them, right? So he's like, you know, kind of like Mike, you know, that's why he only wants 2200s. You know, <laughs> right, uh, right, three right. cells. You know, for his entire right, fleet, so he right. can fly amongst all his planes. So Jim was trying to sure. maximize, not just have those the, sure. the five thousand only for his A ten. He wanted to be able to fly a couple of planes with it. So he got a different motor, so he could fly the Rascal with those five thousand, the six cell five thousands. So um, uh, I recommended a motor to form, and and uh, he he figured out what he wanted and and slapped it on there and. Once again, I went ahead and, and made it for him. Um, luckily, you know, there's no wind. It was just a perfect day. Uh, that plane, <laughs> once again, um, just made me, I, I just welled up and kind of teared up because all I could think of was America. You know, oh, nothing, <laughs> nothing more American than having an overpowered plane. <laughs> All there you that go. Raw power. There you go. <laughs> it was go. just awesome. Wow. Wow. Uh, so go. once again, the wow. plane, wow. the plane yeah. just leapt off the ground. Um, another plane that really you didn't have to fly it past half throttle. Um, that right. one took a little bit longer to get off the ground, but right. once again, it really wasn't a problem whatsoever. Um, and with the bigger prop. Um, it was slower because I, it, I guess because that you know with the windmilling in in the air, it would slow the plane down a lot more than the other one did. So actually, the plane became better to fly with that with that particular motor combination. The plane became 
you know, it became a joy to fly because it wasn't as speed as you were trying to set up for landings and stuff. You had no problems. So, uh, yeah, we uh, once again, now that plane, just plain old stick and rudder, there was no gyro or anything in it. Um, once I went up, trimmed it out, once you know, brought it back down, landed it, you know, gave, gave, gave the sticks over to Jim. Um, pretty much he didn't have uh, too much trouble with it. Um, and we just had a blast with that particular plane. So, uh, yeah. Very cool. The only Very complaint cool. I would have was just that it was kind of a gray day and kind of lost the plane every once in a while, just, you know, just flying around and, ooh, stealth. Oh, it's back. That airplane is uh, red and white, though, right? How could you lose it in a gray sky? Just, you know, the plane's flying away from you, so you can't see the red. You only see the white, you know, and it would get in that gray-white part of the cloud and just kind of whoop until you kind of turned it out, and then you'd see the red, you know, red of the wings. But, uh, no, all in all, another, you know, that was the re-remade, and so for that one, it turned out well. Everything was fine. And, um, you know, Jim was feeling fine. I was feeling fine. Everything was going great. Uh, and then we took a, not a break break, but, uh, uh, since I'd been flying all his planes, I just, you know, I brought out two of my own and I went to, uh, uh, last time I was out with Jim, we took out my, uh, E-Flight Radian XL and mm-hmm. I had a problem with, uh, the mm-hmm. prop was misbalanced and it, the plane just shook like nobody's business. And so, uh, I went ahead and really? reinforced the, the news and, you know, with some carbon fiber, um, re, uh, rebalance the, uh, the prop, uh, to where it was balanced. And so I was all excited. We ran them, we ran the motor up on the bench. It was, you know, smooth like butter got out there, you know, checked the balance and everything on it. And Jim was, went to launch it for me and gave it a good chuck and I throttled up and then the whole front nose just exploded. <laughs> plane got about 15 feet up in the air <laughs> had no motor on the front of it yeah went to go down jim was about to run and try to catch yeah. it and i'm just like no i got it you know and uh and i just kind of you know was able to glide a little bit plopping on the ground went over there and just the you know it broke a prop i don't know whether the prop hit or just the the whole nose where i did the repairs just broke off <laughs> I thought it was a good fix, but I guess it wasn't. Uh, yeah, so, live and Jim's learn. The, the fix, learn. fix yeah, master. Live. Yeah, okay, not yep. so much for me. I don't know whether I, I didn't use enough yep. epoxy. I don't know what it was, but that nose just <laughs> came off, and all the repairs I did on it, toast. So, oh my gosh! Back to the drawing board on that one. So, oh my gosh! Yeah. That's pretty funny. So that actually. was a little disappointing because I was, you know, all That's pretty funny. I was all jazzed up to fly that plane again, and you know, right. Right. well, bummer. You know, you know that airplane has had problems from that airplane has had problems from the day one. One. Yeah, I've had a couple of mishaps with it. Yeah, yeah, a couple, a few. You know, but hey, it, it was one of those uh, Craigslist airplanes. So for the price that I paid for it, you know, eh, I can't complain. Can't go wrong. I, I got my money's right. worth out of it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So after that, I think I flew my wing. Um. You know, kind of get got that shaken off those those the stress of you know having the disappointment of having my plane crash. Um. But it's fixable. Uh. And then Jim goes, hey. Is it time for it to get out the Franken ten? And I was like, "Yeah, let's let's get it out." And and if our listeners don't don't uh, might have forgotten or haven't heard about this, um, so Jim had gotten uh, it's an E flight A ten, right? It's their sixty four millimeter air uh, engines in it. I think that's correct. Okay, um, so we maidened it. That's correct. The last time when you were here, or I should say, you made in the plane. That is correct. Right. So uh, when we flew the plane, the you know, when we maidened it, or you maidened it, the plane flew really well. We were still trying to figure out the whole safe stuff and what it meant and, you know, what it was going to do. 
Um, and that was a little difficult for us because, you know, we didn't exactly read the instructions, but uh, still trying to figure out was, you know, what's the safe mode supposed to do as opposed to the gyro. You were having some problems with that. Well, the good news is, um, luckily, since Jim had um, – he okay, so after we, – we did crash that plane a little bit, or I should say I crashed the plane because I flew it, and on my landing, I ripped out one of the gear. Um, well, Jim had to actually ma- remanufacture that part, which he did for the next time when we took it out. Uh, unfortunately, Mike wasn't there for that. Uh, and I went ahead and I made in the plane, and uh, it flew, no problem. Um, Jim remodified the, the landing gear so it could definitely you know, take off of a rough field. Fantastic job, because he couldn't get any parts for that particular plane, and with COVID and, and them not manufacturing things, there were no, there are no spare parts for the plane as of yet. They're not supposed to come to like next year. So any repairs he's done or anything he's done, he's just whittled uh-huh. out of you know on his own. So anyway, um, so I flew it the second time, and let's see, I, I'm trying to remember what happened the second time I flew it. But anyway, I think. I think I cra- it, it crashed again on, or the gear rip, ripped out, and this time it was the back gear that ripped out on the, uh, on the grass. Um, and then Jim repaired it again. Uh, and, and when it crashed, it kind of ripped the nose off. It wasn't a bad crash. It was pretty easy to fix. So when Jim brought it out this third time, and once again, I went to re-remaiden it, um, the plane this time he had totally redone the gear and redesigned it so it was much softer and could take much more abuse. Um, reinforced reinforced everything, put more braces in the plane and the wings, everything. Um, I took it off that next time. Um, went to went to take off. The plane took off beautifully. Made a left hand turn. Was flying downwind. Got three quarters of the way down the field, and then the plane just turned over on its back like a turtle and just kapow into the ground. And we're like, "Oh man, that's you know that's toast." And I think I, uh, well, I'll, have, I'll put some pictures up. It, it, you know, the other breaks and crashes were hard, uh, but that last one mm, that kind of almost sealed the deal for the plane. And I and Jim was like, "Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'll just get another body or whatever." And I was thinking, you know, for his Christmas right. gift this year, we'd buy him a new body. Right. Well, he. You know, guess he was bored, and uh, he had all the parts. We picked up all the parts and pieces, and he whittled sure. and did his magic, and he sure. rebuilt the Franken ten. That plane will not die. So he right. rebuilt the whole thing, and then he right. was having problems because you know servos went in backwards, upside down, whatever. The programming right. decided to reboot in the in the receiver itself, so he bought the. Um, the programming cords so you can hook it up to your PC or your laptop or, you know, your, your oh, tablets right, and right. stuff uh, came over to my house oh, right. about two weeks ago and we spent an afternoon just going through reprogramming it, playing with it, looking at all the modes. And we finally got a good understanding of what the safe mode does, what it actually does, what's actually built in the, in the receiver, some things that you can't change. Um, mm-hmm. And then just the plain old gyro mode. So, uh, uh, so as simply as I could put it, you know, we, cause we were thinking, oh, well you put it in the safe mode, it'll just instantly write itself once you flick that switch. And that's not exactly what it, what was happening. All right. So, you know, from the best that I can understand, once you go above 20% throttle, the, the gyros already, it already initializes itself and it's flying like a normal gyro, like our, like our lemons, right? right? Just, you know, it's flying. Right. You can turn, you put gain in, take the gain out and it, and it does normal stuff. When you put in the safe mode, the best way I can describe it is kind of like if you're flying a drone and in a drone, you can have different flight modes and you can have right. it where you know, no matter, you know, it fly, it flies along a heading and you can turn the plane any, you could turn the drone any direction and it'll just steer however you, however the direction that you have it going. Right. Um, right, in this right. one, um, it has degrees of bank. All right. So you can define with the, if you, if you have the, the programming cord, you can define how many degrees of bank the, 
and, and you got to think of it separate too. You have the receiver, which its own, which is its own device and thing, and then you have this model. And so when they give you the model, they they preset this thing up for you. But if you have the programming cord, you can go in there and you can mess with that stuff if you don't like the way they set it up. Otherwise, there's really no way you can get in there and, and play with that stuff. So anyway, I think I think the way it comes from the factory, it's set up that you can't do over 60 or maybe it's 50 degrees of bank. Um, and if you do, like let's say you're, you're making a right-hand turn and then you get a gust of wind and it blows your plane over and let's say it flipped your plane upside down. Well, the plane will automatically try to right itself to get back within that 60 degree bank angle, right? So the harder you the harder you pull on the stick to the right, as the plane starts turning to the right, you'll notice that the ailerons will start lessening the amount of, you know, bank. So let's say they were 45 degrees, you know, turn, turning. As you start doing more and more degrees, you know, to get closer to your 60, it'll it'll start evening it itself out or going the opposite direction to correct for that, you know, that 60, the closer you get to 60, the less it allows you to, even though you have it buried to the right, it'll start taking that stuff away from you. So it's kind of cool for a beginner person that they can't roll the plane. They can't, you know, they can't loop it. They can't get it in a turn and lose it. Like, oh no, I lost it. You know, which way is it going or turning? Well, if all they got to do is just let go of the stick. Dink. The plane straightens itself out, just keeps flying straight until you can kind of figure out, you know, what you're doing. Now, that just means you just make bigger and bigger circles, okay? And and after I, I flew it in that mode when I, you know, first got right. it up and I'm trying it out, and, and Jim's like, yeah, do a roll, do a loop. And I'm like, no. <laughs> well, try the flaps. I'm like, no, I'm not trying anything. I'm just going to I'm just gonna trim the plane out, get it on the ground, make sure everything works before I start, you know, getting crazy with it. And I think, like, the second flight I took it up, I went ahead and I flicked the switch for the uh, the safe mode, and I was flying it around the safe mode, and it was work. The safe mode was working. It was working in the right direction. I don't like the safe mode, just because the you know the way I fly and just you know experience as I am, it's it's it makes the plane feel weird, right? Uh, it doesn't. It's not flying right. Uh, it's unresponsive. Well, of course it is because you know it's not doing its thing. Um, but I. Um, uh, I think the second or third time we flew, I, Jim and I were on a buddy box. I gave it to him, put it in low rate, let him fly it in the safe mode. And I said, dude, you know, now that I've flown this in the safe mode, I don't think you're going to like it. And he's like, well, why not? And I go, well, I don't know. You may find it kind of weird because I find it weird. And you're you're probably going to want to bank and you expect the plane to bank over, you know, and it's not going to do that. It's It's going to turn, but you're going to be like, yeah, it's not turning fast enough. And that's one of the first things he started complaining about. He's like, "Yeah, this thing's not turning." And I go, "Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's just gonna baby, it's just gonna baby you around in a turn." Now I said, "Turn," you know, we we had high rates and low rates. I said, "Turn up the high rates." We did. He turned up the high rates, and it turned a little bit faster, but still, it was annoying because it wasn't turning. Like the, he, you know, he flew the Panther, right? So the Panther, you know, turned all around. You know, and that A ten was just. Boca, 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 boca. It was just poking along. So the great thing about it is you could take a person who doesn't have much EDF experience, hand them this plane, put it in the safe mode, and they're going to tear big holes in the sky. And just, you know, the the only bad part about it is it takes you so long to turn that I could see where that, and that plane flies pretty quick. You know, it gets up, it gets on step, right? That I could see where a beginner might get the plane out of, you know, out of their view where they can't see it. You know what I mean? Their orientation might get thrown off. So that's the only bad part. So basically by the third, the third flight, Jim kind of had a feeling for it. So I turned, I, I turned the plane back to low rates, turned the safe off. Cause I had control of that. And, uh, he started the pl- flying the plane around like normal and started enjoying it. And he was having a blast. And like I said, that plane was, could slow right down and speed right up. And, Dude, you okay? So the, I'll have to show pictures of 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 the the Franken ten, because you know the body's got a you know kind of you know uh, candy wamp, wampus. You know it's all kind of bent. You know it's got that a little bit of a banana shape to it. So we were thinking it wasn't right. going to fly straight or you know do very right. well. Dude, it it was like two clicks you know up and to the right, and the plane was flying dead center, and it was flying just like when we got it new out of the box. 
And I was like, wow, this plane is flying great. Wow. So uh, anyway, I, um, uh, you know, took it around the patch. Jim flew it. He, he you know, he likes it. Um, I brought it in for a landing. And once again, I thought I was I was going to grease the landing on. I kind of did, but I don't I think the front gear got caught on a clump of grass tore the front gear out that just the front landing gear so i only tore one out but i didn't break i didn't break the linkage and you know how like on our uh on the l39s you know after a while the the way they glue them in you know you just tear all you know it, those things come out eventually and you got to re-glue them back in just because they use sure. that uh it's that silicon paste crap or whatever well it, you know they kind of do the same thing cuz when cuz when I, uh his thing pulled out and it's a perfect mold right of where it was supposed to go in and you can see how there wasn't any glue you know on the section that pulled out like there was no glue on it right. you know so it's an easy fix and the only thing that got broken was the control horn on the servo but Jim had he had replaced all those servos with metal geared servos so it didn't break nothing easy fix Oh, great. Um, you know, so there really wasn't any damage to the plane. Um, so I told him the good part about the Franken 10 is that, you know, we can beat the plane to death, uh, before you get a new body. Well, before a body's available, there's no bodies available until like next year anyway. You know, even simple, like, like landing gear you can't get. Um, so, uh, in fact, he didn't get, he right. just got the programming cable that just, just came in. And that's the only reason why we were able to, you know, fix it. But uh, all in all, dude, it was a very successful day. Uh, you know, I I almost didn't want to fly that plane again because you know I kind of crashed it three or four times, and I was feeling you know I wasn't feeling too froggy. Sure. And then after I flew it, you know that after that one flight, I was just like, oh, I'm back. You know, this plane's not that scary anymore, and everything was working fine. Right. So yeah, I right. once again. Once the plane well, is set up correctly, I, I, it's awesome. Yeah, I have to give uh, Jim kudos because, you know, ED, the EDF world is a little bit different. And, you know, Jim really kind of jumped in this thing and he's, you know, got the Panther and, you know, now he's got the A-10. And even though he's had issues with it, I've seen guys that fly the, you know, the EDFs, they crash them and then they're out. And and Jim is like, no, I'll just repair it and you know fly it again. And so, it, it's good to see that somebody's you know got that fortitude to just stick with it, even though you, you know he could have technically just said, ah, eh, it's just crashed it, and you know, I don't want to build it again, and you know just leave it in the trash. But it's good to see that he's you know getting back into it and back on the saddle and having fun with it, compared to just being upset that yeah. And that that was the good you know like that, I said that the fun part was watching his smile right. The, when, when the when he was flying the plane, the plane was flying great. Just looking over at him with the smile on his face was, mm-hmm. you know, that was priceless. You know, I I felt good because, like I said, I was feeling really bad. Right. Yeah, yeah, I was feeling really bad after, like I said, crashing his plane. Right. I mean, bad crashes several times. Oh, and I, that's right. The on that third reason why I crashed it the third time was because, uh, if everybody remembers, when Jim put it together, he had the servos backwards. So when we did the flight check, right, left, right. you know, whatever, the, the, I didn't catch the ailerons were backwards. So when I went to take off, you know, right. stuffed in the ground with that one, and that was a bad crash. That was, that was, a, lot of foam, that was a lot of foam dust. Yeah. <laughs> well, the pictures that you sent, uh, they do look good, and uh, we'll post them on our listeners group. And uh, or or if you're on your watching your YouTube channel, Jay can probably put them up there too. But um, it is very impressive. I mean, he did a good job. And he, I think you told me last time that he did something to the landing gear to make it better suited for grass. Uh, you know. Grass. Yeah. So the the landing gear, if you remember, it, they were very stiff. So he had taken out the uh, he had taken out the springs that were in there and remade new springs so that it was a lot cushier. You know, it gave a lot more travel. Um, and then he redesigned for the front gear. He had broken off a bracket, um, and he basically whipped out, you know, a little file and a little mill or whatever he was using. He remilled the part, you know, or he found a part that was kind of close and got in there a little file and filed it back down. So it was just like the original, and, you know, 
was able to get it all back together, you know, because he couldn't get the spare parts. So that was the amazing part. So he was able to conjure up what he needed and fix it all. And like I said, it, it worked better than the original. So if you get one of these, and I, I recommend it still, but if you're not flying off a, a an actual uh, runway um, and grass or whatever, you you need to soften up the gear. Oh, he softened up the gear and he changed out the tires. He got uh, spongier, foamier tires because the tires were rather hard. And it makes a it makes a world of difference on, on the plane. So, well, flying it off of that surface, you mean? Yeah. So, yeah, because I fly on a grass field. Yeah. If, if everybody didn't know, yeah. Right, right, right. And I and I uh, I totally get it. So, well, it sounds like uh, you guys had a really good time out there, and the weather was good, and you know, everything came home. So. Everything should have been there. So, I know. I really should have. The weather was nice here, too, but I had another commitment. So I had to had to finish my stuff. Uh, I had to do with real, real, uh, I shouldn't say real, full-scale stuff that I had to do. So there you go. Well, uh, it's great that you had a good time uh, with Jim, but I, I do want to bring up uh, a video that you sent me. Uh, that was a little disturbing. Uh, you, you sent it a couple of um, oh yes. a week ago. Of, yes. uh, and <clears throat> this particular video that Jay sent me was of a uh, city council. And well, it doesn't matter what city council it is, but it was a city council that was meeting uh, based on what they considered drone law, right? It was... It was their ability to address the fact that drones were flying in their neighborhoods or in their town, and they they were really wondering how they could municipality they, they kind of keep that municipality. Thank you, and they were really wondering why you know how it was that they could. I guess the word would be um, regulate. Um these drones that were flying out, you know, in, in the neighborhoods or in their municipality. Anyway, it was very interesting to me how this whole thing took place because the FAA has put laws into place currently. Uh, a lot of cities have put, you know, laws into place or at least created areas where unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, RC airplanes, drones, whatever you want to call them, uh, can go fly in specific areas. But then there's some municipalities that just want to ban them all together. And those are the ones that we, that I, I kind of take issue with. So, um, why don't you, you know, kind of bring us up to speed about what, what the video was and, and, why it was so disturbing. Yeah. So like you said, it was a council meeting and they're sitting there talking about the problems or and issues they're having with drones, which they weren't having any issues with drones. Right. It, it was all a perceived right. fear because they were like, Oh man, you know, people just, anybody can grab a drone and just fly it. And they, they're going to be peeping in people's windows and they're going to be hovering outside anybody's windows and they, and, and uh, we got to stop that. And we, so we need to come up with some regulations to stop people from just flying drones in our parks or flying them, you know, willy nilly all over the, all over our city. Um, it's going to be a disaster. People are going to be losing their privacy. Um, it's going to be trespassing. You know, we need to come up with some way of stopping this. And the, so first of all, there wasn't, it wasn't like they said, Hey, on the 5th of August, we had this guy come here and he, he did this thing and he crashed it into the school or he crashed it, you know, into the hospital or the old folks home. It was, there was, it wasn't an issue like that. It was just a perceived threat, no proof of a threat. It was just, Hey, this could happen. This, Oh my gosh, it could happen. It, oh my we, we got to do something to present something that could happen, not that it did happen. And so they were kind of going over, well, can we make a rule to, you know, make the things fly higher or not, or they can't fly over, 
you know, our park where they can't fly in these places. And at least one of the guys that was there was like, well, no, but we we could make a rule where you couldn't take off, kind of like the national parks. You, I can fly over the national park in a drone, but I can't land or take off from a national park in a drone, you know, because that we own the land. So they can't come up, they can't take out take off in our municipality. And so they were all like, oh, man, that sounds great, you know, and they're all, you know, agreeing on this stuff. And then they were like, well, if somebody does this, you know, we, we, we need to we need to find them or they need to be fined and stopped. And then they were like, well, one guy was like, oh, yeah, well, um, you know, the FAA, uh, I was talking to one of our police officers and he says that there's a, you know, with the new FAA rules, they're going to have a way of tracking when people are flying these drones. So if, so if our cops see somebody flying a drone or, or think they're flying a drone, they can look up, they can look to see who it is and then we can find them. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, wow, that's one of the things I was just talking about, you know, the last uh the, you know, I guess that was two or three uh, podcasts ago about these guys, you know, starting to regulate, mm-hmm. you know, find people. And once again, they're finding people for something that the FAA, I mean, you know, isn't finding anybody for, but they're but they're going to get a fine and they're going to make the police do it, who have even less knowledge than anybody else. You know, right. they got to deal with cri- real crimes. And here they are trying to make revenue for this municipality for people flying their drone. So, uh, yeah, it just, it was just one of those things that was getting out of control in the, and in the uh, video there, the four people who are watching are kind of, they're, you know, kind of like us, they were giving their opinions and, or, or they had dealt with getting rid of regulations in, you know, townships and villages and stuff like that. And, you know, they were putting in their two cents, but it, it just was frightening to me, you know, where we were kind of just, you know, I, even though I was worried about it, I, I really wasn't worried about it. You know what I mean? I, I didn't think they, the police were going to be kicking down the doors. But here it was. These guys got this half-baked idea, and everybody in the council's just going with it. And they were just like, oh, yeah, we can find them, and then this and this. and then, Oh, we can get some tools to be able to do that. And, you know, and, and they didn't have – it wasn't like they said, hey, let's call up the FAA and see what tools or things we have to worry about. They, they never – got a person who flew a drone they didn't have somebody in there representing people who fly they were just going off this half baked idea of what was going to be happening with nobody i guess no resident experts nobody who was in the industry in their town flying the and then it did dawn upon they said hey well what if there's a fire or a missing person well we don't want to find those people you know if we could drones would be helpful to find a missing person or, you know, spot a fire or something. Okay. Well, I guess we should write in something about, you know, the, uh, the person should be licensed or they should have this stuff, you know, pass a, a test or do a thing in our township, you know, get a special license. And I'm just like, now you got to get a special license to fly in the township. Interesting. So yeah, it, it just, it, it just, well, what was amaze me. What was what was interesting to me was that how quickly it built on on each other on on base on the basis of nothing, right? Because the the councilman that started the, that actually introduced this type of legislation stuff had not had anything drone related happen to him. It was because he had seen or heard something from another person in another township that said, oh, yeah, this is what happened. And then they looked at that township and said, oh, we should copy them based on their problems, not ours. And it, and it escalated. It got to the point where they were, they were wanting to do some things that were contrary to what the FAA has said, you know, like making these tests and examinations and, and you know, licensing problems in their town that were far in exceedance of what the FAA has already required. And they did talk with zero knowledge of what the FAA has required. So you would think that if you're going to create this, uh, you know, policy or municipality policy or rules or regulations or whatever, that you would have at least done a little bit of homework nationally to see, okay, well, we know the FAA regulates the airspace. How is it that they're regulating, you know, 
UAV usage at the moment? And then what do we need to do in order to, you know, enforce that or, or keep it, uh, you know, kind of go in the direction we want it to go. But I, I was really shocked because they did ask the guy, oh, have you had, you know, issues with the drones or anything? And he goes, oh, no, no, I, I haven't had any issues. Nobody's flown into my house or nobody's flown over my house or peeked in my windows or any of that stuff. But they kept bringing stuff up, you know, what if scenarios and then trying to solve the problem for the what if scenarios rather than waiting till it happened. And that was very troublesome for me. Yeah, it, that, that that was definitely very scary, you know, and this is just a small township. It's not like uh, like in New York City or a bigger city or town, uh, you know, it, it was a kind of a smaller place. So, you know, and they were just kind of going off the cuff, going nuts over mm-hmm. this thing. Oh, they're going to be, you know, we, we need to make new laws if, if, if somebody's peeping in windows. And I'm just like, yeah, they are, you already have a law about peep, people mm-hmm. peeping. I'm sure you have a law yeah, in your books. Law, you don't sure. need to create a new yeah, one just yeah, because sure. the guy put away his telescope and now has a drone. And then do you realize what you can see out of a drone? You're just seeing this. It's not like you're seeing a, you're flying a, a, a global hawk, you know, and I'm reading the guy's right. newspaper right. from, you know, 30,000 right. feet. Right. You know, right. you're, right. you're looking through this, you know, right. old camera <laughs> technology, analog camera technology, and, you know, everything's kind of grayish and, you know, flickering, <laughs> you know. Right. I, I don't know what kind of pic, you know, like you said, I could right. get a better picture with my, you know, zoom camera from across the street. Right. If I want to peep at your house or a telescope right. Right. or something. Right. So, yeah, it, it just, it was disturbing. Your, your and, and, Samsung uh, phone is better than that. right. So yeah, that on a balloon would probably be, you yeah. know, a better, better <laughs> setup. Right. A better peeping Tom setup. Uh, that's too funny. Well, it it is something that we need to uh, deal with, and you know, if we're dealing with it, or at least watching for it, because it, I think there's going to be more of it. Uh, I think some of these politicians or legislators that, you know, kind of look at it as a matter of, oh, well, we need to get out in front of this before it gets too bad, and I, I really don't think it's going to get that bad. I mean, you, you know, you're you're not going to have hundreds of millions of people flying drones into everybody's windows and. Uh, you know, I think they're going to worry too much about this. Walmart now is is doing drone, trying drone deliveries uh, within a certain mile radius where they fly it, yeah, drop so. it, and that kind of thing. So I think they're going to have to worry about the commercial side of it more than the hobbyist side of it. But they seem to be more worried about the hobbyist than the commercial side, which really boggles my mind. So, but anyway. It, what it says to me is you need everybody, you know, wherever, you, wherever it is that you live in the United States or the right. world listening to us, right. Right. you need to be involved right. in your local government, you know, or at least just watching not them. having no clue what's or at going least watching on. Them. Yeah. Because, you know, these guys were ready to write new laws, write new stuff. And all it took, you know, to counter them would be one guy to walk in there and go, hey, I, you know, I want to get my two minutes to talk and go in there and kind of set them straight, you know, and say, hey, there's, you know, there's a whole opportunity of people that, you know, are doing this right. thing and you're, right. you know, you're stopping our, our perfectly legal hobby, you know, and you're, you're, and the stuff you're doing is overbearing on us, you know, I, you know, that kind of thing. And so definitely right. I could see where. You know, like I said, if if you and I lived in that town and went to that meeting, I'm sure we could cause a ruckus by bringing a few facts and, you know, dispelling some of their fears. I would have brought a drone to their meeting and just flown it around on the inside of everywhere so that they could, you know, experience the actual, you know, drone flying around their their meeting. I think that would have been much better. Like you said, put them under the goggles and, and let them see and go, huh, that, you could barely see out of that thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, let them experience it and they go, oh, that's, it's nothing like I thought, you know, the type right. of pictures you have or the pictures right. you can get. And you go, well, that's because that's from, you know, this better camera that's on the outside. But I can't, you know, it's hard for me to direct it and know that I'm pointing, you know, if I was trying to peep in somebody's window, it'd be hard for me to get this thing lined up and know that I'm pointing in the window. And then, you know, it's windy outside and the plane, you know, the, the drones are going up and down and. <laughs> 
side to side. It's it's it, <laughs> right. It, it's not right. that easy. So uh, this reminds me just of it's a quick hard st- enough to control on a normal day. Right. So this reminds me of a quick story when I was back in the Air Force. When uh, so I I got everybody. If you remember, I got uh, the flying club I was in. I was able to get us uh, an indoor flying site using an old B fifty two hangar that we used to that we had on base, and they right. had converted a half of the half right. of that building into a gym, but the rest of it mm-hmm. was still open. And so mm-hmm. I was able to, you know, I wanted to be able to fly in there with the little with the little UM, UMX style air, airplanes and stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, you know, found out who owned the gym. You know, owned it. Uh, what commander it was, went down to the, uh, it was the M- MWR, Moral Re- Welfare and Recreation Commander. So I, I got a meeting with the guy and uh, walked down to his office and said, yeah, sir, I, I would like to come down. Uh, well, I wrote a proposal and sent it to him. And uh, that was a mistake because he got it. And went, they want to fly, they want to fly remote control airplanes with, with metal blades you know, in indoors with with engines, oh no way! That's too dangerous. And I, right. I'm like, what? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, because I right. I had another representative that you know he knew the commander. He took the, my proposal to him, and he goes, "Yeah, the commander was not too happy with the idea of flying, you know, big aircraft, you know, planes in in there with you know metal props and you know." gas motors and i go who who said anything about that did, did, did he actually read it and look at the pictures that i sent attached with them <laughs> so I, I got another meeting and i went down to his office and i brought down i brought down a um you know he was having a, a board you know they have like a little like a board meeting on mondays you know everybody meets up everybody mm-hmm. in his command so i went down there and i brought mm-hmm. a uh, a little viper uh vapor you know uh so that's oh, yeah, basically that, that stick plane oh, yeah, with just the little film on it and uh, yep. I took it off, and I was flying it around in the office. Yep. And I said, sir, this is what I want to fly in the gym. This is what we're going to be flying. And he's like, what? I, that's nothing like what, you know, I thought you were going to be flying in there. And I go, why would I want to fly metal? Oh, I can go outside and fly that stuff. Why would I want to fly that indoors? That's dangerous. Right. Like, you right. know, what kind of guy do you think I am? Right. So after he saw what we were going to fly, he was like, oh, yeah, that, in fact, that looks like a lot of fun. And I go, yeah, because we're going to have kids there, you know, this, that. It's going to be good for youth. It's good for moral, you know, moral rec- you know, welfare and recreation, sir. It'll be another feather in your hat because nobody else is flying indoors with harsh winters like we have in Alaska. Right. You're going to be the right. first commander to do this. And he was like, oh, yeah. You know, so once I kind of built it up, that it'll, you know, it'll reflect nice on his record. Yeah, it went through. Right. But. The proposal I sent right. laid out everything that I was going to do, how we were going to set up the safety zones, how we were going to fly in there with the people with the gym, you know, using the gym equipment. And, you know, and I had a safety background, so I did my homework, and, you know, and they didn't even look. They just were like, oh, my gosh, metal planes with sharp metal things and metal engines and gas. Oh, my gosh, that's horrible. <laughs> so I, I can see where this, this they the council. They just automatically assumed the yeah, and that's what, and that's exactly what these guys were doing. They they had no clue, no, you know, they were feeding upon each other the fears and the terrible, the peeping toms, and I don't want my daughter being, you know, gawked at, you know, just crazy stuff. So, right, right. Anyway, buddy, it uh, looks like it's that time again. I know, man. Our hour went up pretty quick. It was uh, all those stories of Jim's uh, great flying ability and stuff, but. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you have an experience or if you have an idea about your town or municipality doing something they shouldn't, send us an email at uh, parkfirepodcast@gmail.com or jump on our uh, listeners group Facebook page at the Parkfire Podcast Listener Group. Uh, make sure you um, you know subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and let us know what you think. We uh, we love to hear from our listeners and we occasionally hear from them all the time. I think uh, you just got a. a an email from a guy talking about uh, how you could get some more 3D printed stuff or whatever. So that was good. We're getting uh, you know, getting stuff. Uh, I think we've got uh, holidays uh, coming up. We've got a Christmas episode, I think, uh, in two weeks. But um, until then, I'm Michael from Arizona. And I'm Jay from the hills of Texas. And we'll see you in two weeks.
You have been listening to the Park Flyer Podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your next visit. Please give our show a star rating and review, and feel free to email us your questions, topics, or suggestions to parkflyerpodcast at gmail.com.